mic check, please. Hey everybody, welcome back to the Ducks Limit Podcast. I'm your host, Chris Jennings. I'm your host, Dr. Mike Brazier. My name is John Gordon. I'll be your host. And I'm your host, Katie Burke. Welcome to the Ducks Unlimited Podcast, the only podcast about all things waterfowl. From hunting insights to science-based discussions about ducks, geese, and issues affecting waterfowl and wetlands conservation in North America, we bring the resource to you, the DU Podcast. Hey everybody, welcome back to the Ducks Limited Podcast. I'm your host, Chris Jennings. Joining me today is a very special guest, a contributor to Ducks Unlimited Magazine, Chris Madsen. Chris, welcome to the show. Hey, it's great to talk with you. You know, one thing that we like to do with all of our guests who are new to the DU Podcast, obviously you're not new to DU Magazine and Ducks Unlimited, but new to the DU Podcast, I'd like to give you an opportunity to kind of introduce yourself, tell everybody where you're from, you know, kind of your background and, and what all you do for the magazine. Yeah, uh... Well, I grew up uh, on essentially on the Mississippi River, right where the Illinois comes in. And so I guess I cut my teeth on hunting the backwaters along the Illinois, Stump Lake, uh, the Glades. Those local folks will recognize those names. And those were in the lean years, the 1960s. And so there was a lot of hunting and not very much shooting. And I'd just about given up on the idea of duck and goose hunting as any kind of thing I wanted to do. And then got a job with uh, in central Kansas. Just as I was getting ready to leave, my dad looked at me and said, here, here are four dozen Flambeau duck decoys. You need to take these with you. And so I took them with me. And since I had them, I needed to use them. Hunting the small water in south central Kansas was an absolute eye opener for me. The central flyway is one of the great gifts to, to duck and goose hunters. That's right. Then and, and pretty much ever since. Lots of fairly cooperative birds and not an awful lot of pressure, especially compared to the Mississippi Flyway. So I got badly hooked, badly (laughs) hooked there. (laughs) And after seven or eight years, took a position in southeast Wyoming, um, spent the next 30 years in Cheyenne, which is where I am now. And if anything, that far western edge of the central flyway is, is an even better place for a waterfowler than than Kansas was. So I've worn out a lot of duck decoys, worn out a five and a half horse Johnson motor, hunted the little water, the puddles, um, hunted the big backwaters in the Mississippi flyaway. And in the last number of years, when things get really cold here and start to freeze up, I've been sucked into a couple of bigger reservoirs that are almost always great waterfowling and, and occasionally try to kill me. <laughs> yeah, I <laughs> bet. I've written, I've written about a couple of those experiences uh, uh, for Ducks Unlimited, as a matter of fact. Um, you know, one of those, a couple, three of those circumstances, like the ones we're going to be talking about today, where a piece of weather comes up that you didn't expect, and even if you think you're fairly well equipped for it, uh, you can start seeing large chapters of your life flashing before your eyes before you get back to safety. Yeah. So <laughs> that's that's pretty much where I'm at. You know, trained as a wildlife biologist and I've spent most of my life in in outdoor writing, propaganda, conservation work. And so I've been a long, long time member of Ducks Unlimited and and really pleased to be able to contribute from time to time to the magazine. Yeah, and you know that you kind of have alluded to it here. The reason why we wanted to bring you on here today is you wrote a piece for the magazine. I believe it it was last year, uh, and it was called "A Deadly Day for Duck Hunters." And what that story is about is about the Armistice Day storm from 1940 in the Midwest, Upper Midwest, really. And I wanted to come on here and, you know, first of all, we're doing this on Armistice Day. So happy Armistice Day to, for, to you. Um, <laughs> yeah, and to you. <laughs> and, you know, some people may not recognize Armistice Day. And just for a brief little background here, Armistice Day was originally started when at the end of World War One. So on the last day when they signed the Armistice Treaty, that and it was on the eleventh day of the eleventh month, so that would be a November eleventh. It was actually the it was actually the eleventh hour. Of the that's 11th right, day and the eleventh hour. Month. That's correct. Good. <laughs> that's the, hey, that's why we brought you on here for the details of this. Uh, <laughs> but now most people would recognize it as celebrated in the United States as Veterans Day because obviously you know 
after World War I. There was, World War I was supposed to be the war to end all wars. Unfortunately, that didn't happen. So we had World War II and then other wars. And so the U.S. has transitioned um, Armistice Day into all, it's basically for all Veterans Day. Uh, so now that we've got that clear, uh, also, Happy Veterans Day. So, you know, what happened? Let, let's go ahead and start off with this. So, in 1940, kind of set the set the stage here for what exactly happened on Armistice Day in 1940. Well, you know, it had been a crazy, crazy fall. Um, I think the kind of weather that we've gotten more used to seeing, you know, in the last 10, 15, 20 years than, we, than they saw in those days. But they really hadn't had any weather to speak of. Um, uh, across the upper Midwest and and out into the plains, so it was it had been shirt sleeve weather and then more shirt sleeve weather and of course you know the the civilians in town were all tickled to death with that and all the duck hunters were looking to the north saying my God when when <laughs> send us some weather for crying out loud and somewhere on like November eighth so about three days before Armistice Day. A big a cyclone, low pressure system got ginned up in the North Pacific, came on shore in the Washington, Oregon country. And it's interesting, even to this day, when I was, <clears throat> when I was going to school back in the Pleistocene, uh, if you took physics, when, it, when the issue of resonant vibration came up, uh, they, the teachers often had this little film clip that was taken uh, at the Tacoma Narrows across the Columbia River. And the, the Tacoma Narrows Bridge had been finished like just a couple of years before that and was the pride of you know, the local community and the engineers and all that. That low pressure system came on shore, whistled up the Columbia River uh, drainage and caught that bridge and got it oscillating and was at just the right, the wind was at just the right speed to intensify that oscillation, kind of like pumping a, a swing at the local park, mm -hmm. until it finally uh, gave way, broke, and and fell into the Columbia River about 150 feet below. Wow. Uh, and there was some guy there with a, with a video camera, and if you go out online, you can still find the pictures of that low-pressure system of that wind, that gale, ripping out that bridge. So it kind of got people's attention right away. <laughs> yeah. Um, at the same time that was coming, um, the first real cold front of the season was starting to slip down out of the Arctic. My impression is that that, that bulge of cold weather tended to drive that low pressure system south. And so it drifted across Idaho and, and Colorado, intensifying as it went um, until it got to just about Wichita or thereabouts. And then it got hit by, a, by a, a, some moist air coming up out of the Gulf um, and turned pretty much north and headed up toward the uh, upper Mississippi Valley. And so over the, the night of the 10th and into the very first morning of the 11th, that's, you know, it, it, was, it was coming. Yeah. And Armistice Day in those days, a lot of people got... Uh, half day off school, off work. And so there was an awful lot, and, and there were formal celebrations, of course, parades and all that kind of thing. And so people were kind of at loose ends, and there was a forecast that uh, there was a cold front coming, and it looked like there was going to be a system rolling in. And, of course, all the people in town said, oh, no, it's the first bad weather of the winter. And every waterfowler in the upper Midwest said, yay, raw, yeah, finally. We're going. <laughs> yeah, and that, and you mentioned it in your piece that this was basically, it was it was kind of like the perfect storm. And I think, you know, this these day and age, they've got a new name for everything. And, and they would, you know, this would be considered, I think I heard it on the news a couple of years ago, the bomb cyclone. You know, that yeah. that's basically what this would be, except even more powerful than what we've seen, you know, especially uh, recently. A, it, it was in terms of barometric pressure and in terms of wind speed uh, at its, some of its maximum areas, it was, it was formerly a hurricane. The only problem was that, you know, most hurricanes along the Gulf and in the Caribbean, you know, they occur at 75, 80, 85 degree temperatures. And this one occurred at like temperatures that were dropping out of sight into the single digits and beyond. So it was a, it was a hurricane at below zero. <laughs> 
Yeah, and that's that's just wild. And, and what's interesting about this too is we didn't have weather for they didn't have weather forecasting the way that we have it now. Like if this were coming in now, people's iPhones would be lighting up like terrible storm coming in. You know, like in the forties, it was a lot different. You know, they the way that they received their information was so different that some of the, these people, the duck hunters are like, heck yeah, I'm going. This is this is duck hunting weather. So they're all heading out into this, not really even knowing what they're getting into. Yeah, some some were prepared, some knew, you know, had a had a read on it. Mm-hmm. Some didn't. I gotta say, I've, you know, I've been around on the plains for a long time now and I've I can remember very clearly in Kansas one year, almost exactly the same pattern, you know, ridiculously warm weather all the way into uh, early November. And one day I came up out of my hole in the office and looked out the north window and it was bright blue sky and about 70 degrees or thereabouts. And I looked on the far northern horizon and there was this blue black line up there. And I looked at that and immediately recognized it for what it was scuttled over to find my buddy in the game division and said, if you got anything going on this afternoon that can't wait. And, and he said, well, no, no, I'm, I'm, I'm more or less at loose ends. And I said, pointed out the North window and said, look at that. And he said, I'll meet you at your house in 40 minutes. (laughs) And we took off and, you know, he loaded up decoys. I loaded up decoys and we ran nice thing about that part of the world, 20 minutes out of town to a public waterfowl area that was hardly being used and scuttled out there, you know, in a, you know, in sweaters and set those decoys just about the time that that front hit. And I want to tell you, it's, it, was, it was like being a tennis ball at, at Wimbledon. You mm-hmm. know, I mean, that wind came up out of nowhere and smacked us at about 40, 45 miles an hour. And every migratory bird in the central flyway was on that wind. Yeah. No, and and like on this in this storm, like you said, you know, it'll knock you, you know, almost knock you down at forty five. I mean, this storm was producing sixty, you know, I think in your story you had sixty miles an hour was recorded in Chicago, eighty miles an hour in Milwaukee. Obviously that that upper Mississippi area in uh, Minnesota got hit really, really hard. And so and I think what I'd like to talk about now is some of the, you know, some of the harrowing stories that that you were able to pull up. Uh, first of all, you know, where did you get some of these stories? And then second of all, you know, what was kind of your reaction to some of those as you were pulling all this together? Well, to begin with, as far as wind is concerned, mm-hmm. something I don't think I even wrote in that version of that article that I'd stumbled on earlier was, um, you know, the, the Chicago River flowed uphill, oh, wow. you know, un- under the under the force of that wind. And I'm wanting to say, I don't know whether I mentioned in that article or not, but I'm wanting to say there was a, what they call a seish, where a large lake, it uh, the wind is so strong, it actually piles water up on the lee shore. Mm-hmm. And I'm wanting to say that the water level, at, you know, in Milwaukee and Chicago, in Lake Michigan dropped like, you know, two and a half or three feet measurably. The wind was, was that strong, that intense. So... You know, you got guys in, like I say, the the, the Minneapolis Star uh, issued uh, a weather report that morning. It said, hey, there's a powerful storm coming in. The trouble was that a significant portion of the, of the guys who wanted to take advantage of that were, you know, standing in shirt sleeve weather. Mm-hmm. You know, it was, I can't even remember, but, you know, in places like Lansing and, and on the upper Mississippi, um, it was, you know, 70 degrees <laughs> shirt sleeve weather and they had the afternoon off <clears throat> so a bunch of folks went out and it's interesting to me that that a few of the reports you read i can recall one bunch that that had a cabin on an island out in the mississippi um they had a 20-foot boat with an inboard motor and they looked carefully at the weather forecast and they you know, loaded up extra clothes. They had firewood at the cabin, and they motored out there. And their report in the news, um, you know, the next couple of days when when they were interviewed was essentially what you'd expect from well prepared um, waterfowlers who anticipated what was going to happen. They had never seen before, nor had these experienced waterfowlers said had they ever seen anything remotely like it afterwards. The the waterfowl on that storm. Um, they. <laughs> they they said the mallards, cans, you name it. I mean everything. But you know, 
they'd decoy a flock of 35 or 40 birds. They'd come in, hang right over the decoy, start to land. The guys would stand up and, and, and take a, several birds out of it. They'd flare from the shooting and then try to come right back into the decoys. They were um, just looking for somewhere to go. Yeah, because they because they because the birds knew mm-hmm. just how just how uh, extreme the situation was going to be. So there were folks who prepared for it, had the equipment, had the arrangement, or what it turned out to be was a once in a lifetime duck hunt. Unfortunately, a, a lot of people went out, you know, figuring that it was going to be maybe maybe enough for a sweater, but you know, Hip boots and a and a sweater and maybe a a, a, a wax you know canvas uh, hunting coat and ammunition and you know twelve <clears throat> foot boat maybe even just row out and set up out on a shallow island someplace out there and those folks a lot of them got into tr- big big trouble yeah um, now the uh, one thing about that too that it's kind of just you know with with me doing so much product oriented stuff for the magazine. They, they, I guess I'd like think you know they didn't have gear that would be the equivalent of what waterfowlers used. To. Not that that probably would have made a difference in this storm, but you know, like you said, these guys are probably in rubber hip boots and a sweater, and you know, it's not like Gore Tex jacket that's you know fleece lined and all. You know, it's like the gear yeah, yeah. back then was so much different, which probably put them, you know, probably the waterproof gear probably was not as waterproof as what it is today. So, I mean, as soon as it started, you know, waves coming over the side of a boat or something, they're wet. And then that temperature goes from sixties to the twenties. Oh man. I mean, that's just a dangerous situation. Yeah. 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 And of course, (laughs) you know, the equipment that you left back at the house isn't going to do you very much good, you know, regardless of the quality of the equipment. That's one of those lessons that I've had to learn the hard way way, way too often. Because mm-hmm. um, again, I've been in several of those circumstances where you watch a turn of weather, not even this extreme, but pretty extreme. Not only do you need to have warm gear, waterproof gear, but it's a good idea to have your warm gear in something waterproof because you know, if it's if it's soaking wet, even if it's, you know, even if it's down, even if it's, you know, a holofill, if it's soaking wet, it's not going to do you nearly as much good as if it's dry. Yeah, And so, I look at this and say it was one of those, in the legal profession, they call it an attractive nuisance. <laughs> you know, it's a, it's this thing that exerts this powerful attraction on you, and it's not until it, it's too late that you find out that you were attracted into a bad situation. And that night, the temperature dropped, I'm wanting to say, to around 5 in places, you know, like Lansing and Red Wing, you know, th- those areas. They found, over the course of the next couple three days as they were searching they found two guys that had uh they were actually a little better dressed than a lot of the folks um one of them was wearing a one of those long three-quarter length football warm-up coats um over a over a hunting jacket sweater and waders but they tried to get back in off the island that they were on probably because the island was just being swamped Mm -hmm. by waves and they made it to the made it to the bank um but then staggered out, and by that time, you know, we're looking at 70, 80 miles an hour of 80 mile an hour winds. In Minneapolis, St. Paul, they got over 20 inches of snow, like in, you know, in a matter of 12 or 14 hours. And so the visibility was down. Even if it had been light, the visibility would have been poor. The visibility was essentially down to zero. And these guys staggered up, um, looking for some kind of shelter, soaked to the skin because they their boat had essentially. Uh, filled with water by the time they got to the bank. And they found one of them just frozen to death out in a field, and another one dug into a, um, a hay mow. He'd, he'd found this big stack of hay and had dug into it and frozen Ooh. to death there like 300 yards from a farmhouse that they couldn't find. Yeah, they couldn't even see it because of the just zero yeah. visibility. They're just yeah. wandering around in, in the white. I mean, what a terrifying situation. Yeah. Hey, Chris, we're going to take a break real quick. Great. Um, and then I'd like to go through, you know, there's several different stories that you point out in here, and we can just kind of go through those and, and just kind of discuss. And then, you know, uh, the overall just perspective of this storm, you know, and how that potentially impacted families and and not just duck hunters, but, you know, people on the lake, sailors, things like that. Uh, We'll go ahead and get into that just a little bit. So we'll take a quick break here. All 
right. Welcome back, everybody. We're here with uh, Chris Madsen, the author of Deadly Day for Duck Hunters, the Armistice Day Storm from 1940. And we're kind of going through this. Um, just really, we've already set up how the storm has kind of formed and, and materialized and, and became it really became the perfect storm. And I guess there's a, probably a bad way to, to put it in a bad, bad way um, in the upper Mississippi Valley and then across into uh, Michigan and Wisconsin and, you know, even, you know, Chicago was recording high winds, Milwaukee, you know, some of these larger areas. But what we're discussing here is how these duck hunters, a lot of them, and Chris is going to jump into some of these stories here, but they got caught out there going from 60 degrees to sometimes as low as single digits in a matter of hours, they got caught trying to go out duck hunting and a lot of them did not survive this. So Chris, what were some of the specific stories that really jumped out to you um, as far as, you know, how these hunters either, you know, tried to survive, attempt, they did survive or, you know, what, maybe their boat got sunk. And I know I've heard read somewhere, you know, guys turn their boat over to use it as a shield from the wind and snow, trying to build a fire under that. And that, you know, some of them survived that. Yeah. 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 If you, uh, if you had enough, um, if you had enough foresight to bring matches mm-hmm. <laughs> and then you had enough skill to actually build a fire in a situation like that. Yeah. Um, you know, there were people who were burning their boats, you know, burning driftwood. I, uh, Tell the story of that Bill Wernicke and Ray and Carl Terrace, the, you know, the, those circumstances that just make your stomach roll over, you know, the, tried to, tried to get back to the, to the bank and couldn't. Yeah. Boats, swamps, uh, the two older boys are trying to protect the, the youngster, the 17 year old, um, as much as they can. And little by little, you know, they finally get stuck in a bunch of cattails out there, far from the shore, being still beaten by waves and wind and snow uh, and temperatures, you know, in free fall. Uh, over the course of the night, both of the older guys die. And when they found young Gerald, um, he was dug partway into a muskrat house, they said. They pulled him out. He didn't remember the rescue at all. Stuck him into into the hospital and and he lost. He lost some pieces to frostbite and was there until after Thanksgiving getting over, you know, the hypothermia and just general exposure. So, yeah, you know, those those kinds of things. The one of the one of the other stories that I got always amazed me was, uh, you know, the Dick Vice Laverne Reber story, you know, mm-hmm. that, you know, they two two teenage boys and they've got the afternoon off. Their dad's at work. And so. You know, they know what they're doing. They've been out there a lot. Um, so they grab a boat, and launch it, get out on one of the backwaters, and then the storm hits, and they're pretty much stuck out there. And when the weather gets bad, you know, their dad comes home, checks with their mom, and she says, well, I, you know, I know they went out, but I have not seen them back. And he immediately recognizes the likely problems there. Goes to buy, borrow an, another boat, loads it in the back of a pickup truck, gets out there and then tries to let, launch that boat in the surf in that backwater. And every time he tries to launch it, a you know, wave comes in and breaks, fills it with water and throws it back up on the bank. And so finally he he gives up trying to, you know, trying to get out there and sits there most of the night. And <laughs> the quote from the newspapers has always gotten me. He said, you know, he's, he sat there and with a flashlight watching that and in the headlights of the vehicle, you know, watching that surf beat on the shore. And little by little, as the temperature dropped, the amount of ice and slush in the water steadily increased, even though the water was being stirred by that ungodly wind. And bit by bit, that slush and ice started to damp the the magnitude of the waves. So that by dawn or thereabouts, uh, even though the wind was still blowing at, at a good rate, the backwater finally froze over, and they could slide a skiff out there to try to get the kids. As I recall, somebody else actually got to him, got to the kids before that, but they managed to survive it. Um, some of it has to do with how wet you got, yeah, and also whether you could get a fire started. So, what was the total number of you know? And and I I, I think. Even today, it's not even really known the total number of 
duck hunters versus, you know, there all the headlines, there's images in the article where you have headlines from Minneapolis Star Journal, from Minneapolis Morning Tribune, uh, Mankato Free Press that are that told the story, but all the numbers on the headlines are different because I think there was there was so much confusion there. Uh, they didn't know where some people were, and then also you, there was there were several ships that went down uh, on Lake Michigan as well. Correct. Yeah. yeah. Yes, indeed, including including at least one big ore freighter, I think, up on Superior. And one of the problems. <laughs> One of the problems with this is uh, it was it was November of 1940. Mm-hmm. It's interesting to go back and look at those newspapers and get a feeling for the context of the storm. If that storm had happened, you know, last year, or if it had happened in I don't know 1958, uh, I think it would have gotten much, much more play. You have to remember that even though the United States was not in World War II at that point. Um, Pretty much the rest of the free of, of the Western world was, even as they were as the reports on this storm came in to the local papers and and the big uh, Minneapolis and Milwaukee papers, Chicago papers. Those stories were being were competing with with news from Europe, mm-hmm. and I think that's part of the reason that nobody ever really exactly laid laid a finger on precisely how many people could deaths could be. Uh, attributed to the storm. Uh, I think I said in the article, the National Weather Service said 154 people died. How many of those people were waterfowlers? I don't know. Uh, And I don't think anybody really knows. I think, I speculated in the article that uh, probably over 40, certainly the the newspapers were reporting, you know, 20, 25, 30 Mm -hmm. uh, dead. And that's a, that's a heavy toll to pay for an afternoon's uh, duck hunting. Absolutely. Yeah, I mean, like, I mean, I would say probably, you know, a deadly day for duck hunters, but probably the deadliest day just for duck hunters in general. Just like I said, it was almost like, and you kind of alluded to it, it's almost like they were baited out there with this promise of a, a great flight. You know, they were, they knew the birds were coming and that's, and even for duck hunters today, that's hard to turn down. Uh, <laughs> you know, not, 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 you know, I think this is a little bit different, but, um, but yeah, I mean, that's, that's very enticing to be like, Oh, if I, we can get to that Island, we're going to have mallards in our face. And I think that, you know, you kind of look at it from that perspective that you kind of relate I think as a duck hunter, we can relate to that thought process. And I've probably, like you said, you've put yourself in situations. I know I've put myself in situations. But this this story is also a really good reminder of, you know, the the safety. The, what duck hunters do sometimes is, is a pretty dangerous game. It often is. You know, there's, there aren't very many other, I can't think of, maybe surfing, I don't know. I can't think of very many other sports where bad weather, heavy wind, you know, dangerous conditions, potentially dangerous conditions are actually an attraction. Mm-hmm. Um, but by gosh, waterfowling is certainly one of those. And I guess one of the lessons that sticks out to me in this and, and in the kinds of experiences I've had more or less like this, you, you sure need to pay attention to the weather forecast, although we all know that even in this day and age, you know, the precise nature of how the weather is going to work uh, is often perceptibly different from what the weather service says it was going to be. Um, but, you know, when I'm out there fishing in the summertime, setting aside the fact that it's warmer, um, if I need to pull stakes on a big reservoir because it looks like the weather's getting bad, it takes me about as long as it takes to reel in the bait uh, and I can be gone. Yeah. One of the big problems with waterfowling is that when you decide you're going to pull stakes, you know, if I'm hunting by myself in deep water, shoot, it may take me the better part of an hour or more to pick up floaters in a situation like that. You know, Mm -hmm. if they're on 20 foot anchor cords and, you know, I mean, it just takes a long, long time to get gathered up. And the mistakes that I've made I think the mistakes are reflected in the mistakes that some of the people who died in the Armistice Day storm have made, and that is insisting that you're going to go home, that you're going to leave. Um, if you're in a situation where you know the waves are coming over the island you're on, well, you may not have any choice. But for a number of these people, 
they, by gosh, decided they were not going to sit tight. And, and that decision may have cost them their lives. Yeah, they were trying to get back across the bay or get back from the island back over to the launch, yep. you know. And that's, it, like you said, it probably depended on how wet you got. And it sounds like yep. with that high of wind, um, being someone who grew up hunting out of a boat, you can get wet pretty easily, pretty quick. <laughs> and, <laughs> yeah, yeah. And, yeah. and that's running a, you know, 50 horsepower motor that in a, you know, a new war eagle, not a rowboat with a, you know, it's a lot, it's a lot different. Well, in that one story, that one story of the teenager who leaves his friends because he knows that there's another hunting party on the island that's got a bigger boat. Mm -hmm. And so he goes and checks on those guys and he watches them try to launch the boat. And even though it's like a 20 foot John boat, uh, it's, it's completely filled with water almost instantaneously. And so he makes the decision that somebody needs to go and tell the authorities that they need help. Mm -hmm. And so he decides to swim for it. Good Lord. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> and he made, and he made it, he made but, it. Yeah. But, but you, you look at that kind of a decision and say, wow. And again, I've been in enough of those circumstances. You need to stop. It's easy to make a decision like that on the spur of the moment under pressure and not really examine it. Um, and, and it's a good idea to, to stop and think hard before you do something because it could be really stupid. <laughs> and I'm just going to read, just because you mentioned it, and I never thought about this, but I'm just going to read a quick ex excerpt from one of the quotes that you include in the story. And it was one of the first ones, and I thought that it really jumped out to really tell not only the people, you know, the, it's horrible that people did not survive, but even from one of the survivors, um, here's a quick quote from them. And this is from Dale Angler of Alma, Wisconsin. And he was hunting out on Crooked Slough, a backwater of the Mississippi River, about 50 miles southeast of St. Paul, Minnesota. The memory still haunted him decades later. And here's what he said. I am very thankful that all I got out of that ordeal was frostbitten feet and hands, frozen ears, he wrote in 1963. I'm not counting all the nightmares I had the first few years after that day. In every single one, I'm still in that icy water, getting weaker and weaker, swimming toward a dark, snow-covered shore that is never there. So that just kind of puts it in perspective. Holy moly, what a scary situation. If that, if that, doesn't, if that quote doesn't bring a shiver up to the spine, it's because you've never been out in something like that. <laughs> That's exactly right. That is exactly right. So before we get you out of here, Chris, you know, I mean, you kind of mentioned a couple things here, but what do you think moving forward and even for people listening to this story today, what do you think are the takeaways from this? You know, why do we continue to talk about this story every year? You know, when we did it in the magazine, we've done small short pieces online, um, which people can go to ducks.org and check out all they want and, and read the full story because it's a great one. Um, but what do you think are the takeaways from this? Well, it's an interesting thing, specifically with that storm. It is... You know, I've 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 been a long time away from the Midwest now. I've got good friends still there, but you know, kind of been away from that culture. When I grew up, some version of this story was told every time a bunch of duck hunters got together. Practically, mm -hmm. uh, especially if it looked like there was going to be bad weather coming. I'm not quite sure why that particular storm has occupied the imaginations of, of generations of waterfowlers in the upper Midwest, uh, particularly because it's not as if, and it's not like Isaac's storm, it's not like the great Galveston hurricane, it's not like a lot of the other major you know, uh, storms, some of the big tornado outbreaks that, have, that got so much coverage and have had books written about them since then. This is kind of a, it's kind of a private memory, mm -hmm. uh, communal memory among waterfowlers of my acquaintance in that part of the world. Um, and part of it is that it was just, even by the standards of crazy upper Midwest weather, plains weather, it stands out as one of the, one of the real screamers of all time. Uh, and, and it did claim a lot of folks. Um, and so maybe that's enough to explain it. But for whatever reason, I think it still sticks in the minds of an awful lot of people who use that part of the world and still care about care about waterfowl. I said at the very end of that article, one other thing that something like this demonstrates is that, you know, day in, day out, driving up and down the road, you know, with the fences on both sides and, you know, houses here and there, uh, it's it's easy to jump to the conclusion that that we've pretty much tamed tamed the planet. Mm -hmm. We've tamed that part of the world. And every once in a while something rises up 
out of the Northwest that proves that we haven't exactly tamed it the way we thought we had. <laughs> um, and maybe that's part of it as well. And then there are the precautionary, the, the precautionary issues. You know, it's easy when you're 20, 22, 25 years old and still feel like you're immortal and invulnerable to not stop and think about what you may be facing over the next several hours, the next day, um, you know, as you prepare for a, for a duck hunt on the water. And maybe for a lot of us, it's only hard experience that teaches us to stop and think, okay, so what if that storm turns out to intensify twice as fast as the guys at the weather service expected? Those kinds of things still happen. In fact, I'm not too sure that they don't happen a little bit more often these days than, than they once did, than they did in 1940. Uh, certainly this storm was one of those ones. Uh, it would be interesting to know how much better the weather service in 2022 would do with this particular storm than the folks did in 1940. Because it, it, it intensified so fast, and then it was a combination essentially of three convening weather systems, that gigantic low-pressure system, the circulation up the, the uh, Mississippi River from the Gulf, and then that deep, deep cold front coming out of the north. It got a lot worse really fast. Mm -hmm. If you take a look at the difference between the Kansas City weather forecast as it came over and the Des Moines weather, for, weather as it went over, and then look at Red Wing and Lansing and, you know, those places on the upper Mississippi where when it hit there, it, it, was, it was orders of magnitude worse by the time it hit the Mississippi than it was, you know, when it was coming up to the Midwest. And so always in the back of our minds, if we want to come back from a waterfowl hunt like that, <laughs> yeah, it's a, it's a good idea to be taking a look at, okay, so how much boat do I really have? How, uh, when was the last time I did good maintenance on my motor? Because I don't care how big your boat is, if your motor fails you, and I've had this happen, if your motor fails you when you're in six-foot swells, the water, the, the ambient temperature is 20 degrees, and the water temperature is 32.02 degrees, and your motor quits, the fact that you're in a 20-foot boat probably doesn't mean a whole lot. Yeah. Chances are fairly good you're going to go swimming regardless. And so, you know, your life depends on how well that outboard's running. Um, so when was, the last, when was the last time you had it worked on? How well was it running when you left the dock that morning? And then, of course, the fundamental issues of clothing, equipment, as you point out, we got great, great new equipment. And when we pause over that stuff in the closet, we need to think, well, what's the worst case we're likely to face? Yeah. And, and, and be ready for that. And then the last thing is, if you're fairly secure in place and something like this comes up, you need to think long and hard about how much risk you want to take to get back to the dock, to get back home. I recognize that there may be people back at the house who are worried when you don't show up on time. But it's a heck of a lot better to have them a little bit worried than to find out the next day that you drowned. Yeah. Um, and so there's the whole decision-making issue in weather like that. We're never going to, as waterfowlers, <laughs> we're always going to be attracted to that kind of weather. We just need to give it respect. Yep. Yeah, and, you know, growing up running the uh, rivers in Indiana, that was one of the things that I think, you know, we recognized even, you know, 15, 16 years old when people are like, oh, you're not scared to run the river? And we're like, well, at 4.30 in the morning and the river's up, like, heck yeah, I'm scared to run the river. But that's what keeps you safe. You know, it's like, I'm not not going to do it. But it gave that, that little edge of fear <laughs> of hitting the water is what really kind of gave you your caution, you know, taking things a little slower, thinking things through. It's that fear that created respect. And I think that's that's a good thing. And, you know, it's it's unfortunate. It's terrible every year. Um, water, yeah, I, waterfowlers are are lost in, in dangerous situations. I've always I've always loved that no fear t shirt and I've always threatened that I'm gonna get my own version of the no fear t shirt that says fear Nature's way of telling you, don't do that. <laughs> yeah, that's right. That's a good one. <laughs> that's perfect. But that's what it is. I mean, it creates a level of respect. And you hit on a very good point here. And I'll we'll, we'll I'll hit on this maybe a couple things, and we'll wrap this up. But that safety equipment, you know, we always ran with a dry box in the boat, and it yep. had, you know, an extra even if it's just a light jacket, something that's dry, 
you know, that it had extra sets of gloves. It had, you know, an emergency blanket. It had your survival kit. It had things like that. And that's something that as duck hunters today, there's so much fancy gear and so much flash and lights and all this stuff that we can be enamored with. But sometimes it's that dry box um, that needs to be, like you said, maintained maybe, (laughs) you know, take a look at, deeply take a look at it. I'll tell you what, a number of years ago, um, I got really wet, really wet in a really bad storm late in the season. The reservoir that I was hunting had had thawed back out, and it was early January. And I went out, I went out on the north side of the lake and and set up. And bad bad weather came up, and I ended up pretty well soaked. I had a dry bag with me with with a dry coat in it and i put that coat on but by the time i got back to my vehicle on the south side i'd picked up and gotten back i was pretty much soaked again and i remember walking up to my truck which was locked and i tried to get my hands into my my pants to get my car keys out and my hands were so cold that they buckled and i couldn't get them into my pocket and <laughs> i remember thinking to myself well, this is going to be plumb embarrassing to be found frozen to death lying next to my truck because I couldn't get the keys out of my pocket. With the keys this in your ridiculous. pocket. Yeah. Man. <laughs> yeah. But that, I mean, those are the kinds of situations that people can find themselves in. And, and yeah. you know, and, and you're talking about these freezing ice, you know, all of this, you know, I typically hunt in Arkansas now and it's not near as cold, but I think people don't really pay attention to on a 38 degree day yeah you go in that water you, you better have a plan yep. um, it's and so yep. that's something to think about so i think this has been a great conversation chris i'm glad you were able to join us on here and talk about this extremely notable day for waterfowlers um historically ob- obviously a terrible tale of of survival and and lack thereof here, but it is it is also we can talk about this and like like you mentioned maybe maybe there's some takeaways that that are positives and it's a good reminder to tell the story over and over and over again. Maybe maybe it could save some somebody's life you know in a dangerous situation. I sure hope that's the case. And and in the meantime, you know, having gotten all all worried and conservative about bad weather like that, um, I sure hope I'm looking at another quote in that article from another one of the people who was out there. Um, um, he said he was having the time of his life. Redheads and mallards by the thousand were flying over and on both sides of me. These, those ducks had gusts of 60 mile an hour tailwind behind them, mighty hard to hit. Hundreds of ducks came past me within 15 feet, probably going around 80 miles an hour. By 345, I had five mallards and two canvas backs. I hope, <laughs> I hope that all of us see a hunt like that in the near future and that we do it and survive to tell the tale. Absolutely. That's awesome. Well, Chris, this has been great. Thank you so much for joining me. And we'll go ahead and we may have to schedule something. We're going to have to get you back on the DU podcast for sure. (laughs) Pleasure to talk with you. Hope the uh, fall does well for you. I've got to go look for an elk tomorrow before I get serious about ducks. Well, good (laughs) luck out there. Good luck. (laughs) I'd like to thank my guest, Chris Madsen, for joining us today and, and walking us through his article of A Deadly Day for Duck Hunters, which is all about the Armistice Day storm of 1940, which unfortunately several duck hunters lost their lives in in that storm. I'd like to thank our producer, Chris Isaac, for putting the show together and getting it out to you. And I'd like to thank you, the listener, for joining us on the DU Podcast and supporting wetlands conservation. Thank you for listening to this episode of the DU Podcast. Be sure to rate, review, and subscribe to the show. And visit www.ducks.org slash podcast for resources based on today's topics, as well as access to more episodes. Opinions expressed by guests do not necessarily reflect those of Ducks Unlimited. Until next time, stay tuned to the Ducks. Stay tuned to the Ducks.